Good to be with you today. I am Professor Sonia Nouri, Professor of Neonatology at Neonatology uh, Department of Farhat Hashed Hospital, Sous Tunisia, and Faculty of Medicine of Sous. I want to thank the Tunisian Neonatal Medical Care Association for inviting me to the moderation of its third webinar, focusing on necrotizing and fertilizing in newborns. A life-threatening and challenging condition for both pediatrician or neonatologists and pediatric surgeons. I'm very honored to have with us today our uh, two distinguished guests from Egypt, Professor Adel Rial as a moderator and Professor Mustafa Abladi as speaker. Welcome among us, professors. Uh, we'll also be present with our Professor Amina Qsia and Amanel Belalla from Tunisia. Uh, this webinar consists of three parts, two conferences. First one entitled Essentials in Necrotizing Enterocolites, the neonatologist point of view, uh, which will be presented by Professor Mustafa Abnadi. Then Professor Amina Qsia will, be, uh, will present the second conference entitled surgical management of neck. And finally, Dr. Manel Bellallah will present a clinical case, neck in a premature infant, a challenging situation. I kindly invite the participants to mute their microphones. Please, for the participants, write your questions in, in the Q and R sections, and we will um, discuss them at the end of the session. Until now, I think we have um, 700 registered. Uh, we have uh, about 150 participants who are with us now. Uh, before starting, allow me to have a thought to Professor Najla Salem, Professor of Neonatology, who we just lost two weeks ago after a long and courageous battle with the disease. I personally had the chance to work with her for about uh, 10 years. So let's see uh, the video uh, together. الله يرحمها ويصبر عائلتها وأحبابها. Uh, now back to our scientific program. 
as I said, we have with us for the moderation, Professor uh, Adria. He has a very long CV. I just try to, to present Professor uh, Aden. Uh, he is a professor of pediatrics and neonatology at Benha University and Wedding Mill Hospital. He was the head of pediatrics and neonatology department, head of pediatric liver transplant unit and head of infection control unit at Wedding Mill Hospital. Founder and former board member of the Egyptian Society for Neonatal and Preterm Care, the first neonatology society in Egypt, member of the advisory committee of the Egyptian neonatal guidelines. His main area of interest in uh, is CPD in neonatology, but also asthma, vaccines, nutrition, infections, and antibiotics. He is the president of NICAP, Mediterranean International Conference of Applied Pediatrics. He has been practicing neonatology for about 40 years, establishing and designing many NICUs, training their neonatologists and nursing staff. You are welcome again, Professor, and I invite you to introduce the lecture of Professor Mustafa Abdelhamid. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, really. It's a great pleasure and honor being with you, uh, our uh, dear brothers and sisters from Tunis. Uh, and really, uh, I was honored by being invited to participate in such a wonderful meeting uh, uh, in the memory of uh, Professor Najla Salim. Uh, may God bless her soul. Uh, uh, honestly, uh, I'm going to present uh, my, what should I say, my dearest uh, elder son, Mustafa Abdelazi. Uh, he is, a, uh, I don't know what to say. Uh, I used to go honestly to the university to meet him, just to, uh, to have the word around together because he was eager to learn. And uh, he is one of the eminent neonatologists now in Egypt, and he used to be a neonatologist in Saudi Arabia, and he's a professor of pediatrics and neonatology, and the head of uh, neonatal unit in Benha University in Egypt. Uh, I really, I really uh, enjoy working with him. I really uh, feel honored to participate with him in such a wonderful. Uh, uh, simple or meeting. Uh, today he's going to talk about the uh, one of the most alarming and most destructive disease in neonatology, which is the necrotizing anterior colitis. Uh, if you allow me to share my screen, I'm going to say. Uh, few words about the disease. Actually, necrotizing anterior colitis is a disease seen primarily in preterm infants. In some ways, necrotizing anterior colitis is a byproduct of the success experienced in neonatology, where in babies of low gest gestational age who would not have survived 30 or 40 years ago are now surviving. That's why we started to see such a destructive disease. NEC has emerged as one of the most destructive diseases occurring in neonatal intensive care. In addition to extremely high morbidity and mortality and high costs, NEC or NEC carries long-term disabling complications. When examining the literature, one might consider NEC to be a single homogeneous entity, but actually it is becoming clear that NEC has several different diseases or endotypes. Progress in our understanding of the pathophysiology, prevention and treatment of necrotizing enterocolitis has been hampered, hampered 
for many reasons. Included among these is the fact that what we are calling neck is likely to represent different disease processes, which need to be delineated before evaluating individual pathogenic mechanisms and attempting to develop reductive and diagnostic biomarkers. Treatment is also likely to be hampered because not all of the different entities called NEC will respond to the same uh, regimen. Uh, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Professor Mustafa Abdelazim uh, to talk about uh, the uh, necrotizing enterocolitis from the pediatric uh, you know, neonatal point of view. Professor Mustafa, the floor is open for your presentation. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Adil, for very, very kind words. As usual, you're supporting me everywhere, every now and every time. You are my mentor. Uh, it's my great pleasure to share in the first cooperation between the Tunisian Metal Association and the Egyptian uh, societies. And I would like to thank Dr. Amin and Dr. Sonia for uh, the kind invitation. I hope to uh, be, uh, inshallah, a good cooperation in the next uh, uh, sessions, inshallah. Uh, I will go uh, rapidly in the uh, neck. So necrotizing thyroclites, as Dr. Adel said, Uh, is acquired multifactorial devastating gastrointestinal disease associated with high mortality, morbidity, and the cost for the NICU. It's characterized by ischemia, necrosis, inflammation of the bowel, uh, invasion by gas forming organism, and intramural uh, dissection. High mortality, morbidity, and the high cost. Long term complication like strictures, adhesions, cholestasis, short bowel syndrome, failure to thrive, and the most important is the neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, today I will uh, discuss the epidemiology. I will concentrate on the pathogenesis of the necrotizing tirocolitis because it is, it, there is something in you and this is very important in the prevention after that. Understanding the disease pathology or pathogenesis will help us to identify the kinds or the types of NIC as Dr. Adel said, it's not, not one entity now. Uh, what is the risk factor? And I will criticize on the risk factor uh, uh, effect on the baby. The clinical presentation, uh, how to diagnose the NIC and the treatment, uh, especially the medical treatment and the opportunity, opportunity for the prevention. As we know, the majority of neck patient is preterm babies. 90% of neck cases occur in the preterm baby, especially the very low birth weight. Uh, the incidence is inversely proportion to the gestational age. With smaller or younger gestational ages, the incidence is higher. Uh, there is variation in incidence all over the world. Unfortunately, only the high income countries has uh, good statistics. I tried to find in Egypt, to, to find in Tunisia, whole Africa, I cannot find some reports from Asia only. Uh, and we are following the rate of, uh, or the range or the incidence of the high income in countries. Uh, the most recent meta analysis, they found the rate from two to nine percentage and the lower rate and the, the, in Japan. Uh, the pathogenesis, this is a clue here, the pathogenesis is complex, multifactorial, and incompletely understood. The disorder believed to be co uh, a composite results of intestinal immaturity, immature immunological response, or hyperactive immunological response, gut microbiota dysbiosis, uh, plus genetic predisposition. So what is the gut microbiota? The, gut my, uh, the whole body, the body uh, harbor uh, trillions of microbial cells is coordinated in action and are believed to be important for human life. Even the newborn, even the preterm have this high number of microbiota. 
the highest concentration of microbiota actually is present in our GIT. Uh, that microbiota has a small number of opportunistic or pathogens, uh, and the whole number is uh, commensals or beneficial bacteria. Becoming a healthy street only is this opportunistic if the gut ecosystem is disturbed. And this is called the dysbiosis. If there is disruption of the composition with increment of pathogens uh, in comparison to the uh, commensals and the beneficial bacteria, this is dysbiosis. So the abnormal balance of gut microbiota favoring opportunistic and pathogenic bacteria. For a few years ago, this theory is not uh, uh, available in this detail. So gut microbiota is very important now. The, what's affecting gut microbiota will lead us to necrotizing enterocolitis. Uh, this is an example for the affection. The first thing is the mood if delivery, cesarean section. We are, uh, the baby is not taking the most of the vaginal, uh, his mother vaginal uh, commences. Uh, prolonged IV antibiotics, empirical antibiotics, uh, H2 blockers are given to the baby. Uh, a formula feeding, if we started formula feeding, and also pathogens in the environment of NICU, our hospitals. Uh, this is harper or affecting the microbiota uh, causing this biosis. The second important thing in understanding the pathophysiology is the uh, neonatal intestinal barrier. Uh, this barrier actually is the physical barrier and immunological barriers. Physical barriers containing extrinsic barrier or intrinsic barriers. Extrinsic barrier is a form of uh, mucin layer. Uh, this mucin layers reach in immunoglobulin A and the other proteins. Then after this extrinsic yeah, well, layer, we have, we have intrinsic layer. This intrinsic layer is the cells. And between the cells, we have pyet junction. This is protecting the, leak, uh, the, the body flow leaking or translocation of the bacteria. Uh, actually, after that, we have all immunological cells, dendritic cells, macrophage, uh, T helper, T regulator cells, all in the uh, uh, So this is diagram to show what are the problem or the immaturity in the this barrier in the newborn, especially the preterm and also the GIT. The GIT immature, we have decreased peristalsis, we have decreased digestion, we have more gastric, decreased gastric acidity, favoring infection, and decreased uh, proteolytic and uh, digestive enzymes. This leads to stagnation of digestion. Uh, after that, we have altered Decreased mucus coat and all type of mucus proteins, especially this is in preterm baby. Uh, the tight intracellular or in, in, intercellular junction is deficient, altered, with increased epithelial permeability. Also, I have immature mucosal immune system after that, that we are mentioned before. Increased microvascular tone uh, of the mesentery harboring or leading to more vasoconstriction and uh, attacks of skin. Increase the end of the reticulum also present. The most important now, and this is riding in the pathogenesis, is higher excretion of trans uh, 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 toll like receptors for excretion in the epithelial of the uh, mucosa of the intestine. Because as we see after that, we have here this diagram show the pathogenesis or the micro environment of the intestine. We have micro, uh, we have uh, opportunistic or pathogenic organism favored by anti-acids, steroids, uh, TPN or formula feeding. They have direct, direct effect through the toxins or direct effect on mucus degeneration. Uh, also, they can pass through the tight junction. This is loose junction. And into bacterial transfer. As we see, bacterial translocation cannot take 
and there is leakage to the system here to the blood reaching the circulation. And this is why we have usually sepsemia and necrotizing tuberculitis at the same time. On the other side, we have the translocation, uh, sorry, the toll like receptor 4, which is stimulated by lipopolysaccharides of the toxins or the, or the bacteria. This uh, relieving the uh, pro inflammatory uh, mediators, especially interleukin 8, tumor necrosis like tofen, and the platelet activating factors and others. This pro inflammation uh, passes through the blood and causing the toxic effect. Both of them affect the, the, the damaged endothelium and cause vasoconstriction. We have translocation of bacteria, we have pro inflammatory inflammation. These inflammatory, pro inflammatory cytokines, which pass through the blood, has effect on the brain. And so we have a composition of prematurity affecting the immaturity of the intestine in the form of motility digestion, circulation, barrier function, and the immune response, all of them leading to the neck. In the present of this biosis, which help in occurrence, we have genetic predisposition. Genetic predisposition is supposed actually in the expression of the uh, uh, T uh, like. Uh, sorry, uh, told receptors and the immunomediators. This is why some babies have the same, other, the same uh, circumstances and some develop neck and the other do not develop neck. So the risk factors 100. We know prematurity is a disease. Neck is a disease of prematurity. 90% is preterm. Enteral feeding, 90% of necrotizing interior colitis cases has one feed minimum, uh, low upgar score, less than seven at five minutes, body temperature uh, at admission uh, uh, or at what one hour age, 36 or less, the baby delivers cesarean section at rest. Also, if we give H2 antagonist exposing to its empirical antibiotics, sepsis, nootropic support, severe metabolic acidosis, BDA, gastrochesis, severe anemia, polycythemia, bagged RBC transfusion is a risk factor, use of endomethacine with or without dexamethasone. These risk factors still mentioned in the preterm baby. What about the full-term baby? Uh, uh, full-term baby, actually, we have risk factors different uh, in the full-term. As we said, we have like 10% of NIC cases can occur in full-term babies. We have fetal growth restriction, this is the most important, exposure to perinatal asphyxia, formula feeding, pre-existing illness, such congenital heart disease, primary gastrointestinal disorder, sepsis, hypotension, and polycythemia. As you noticed, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is no more one of items in the pathophysiology or pathogenesis of neck in the preterm babies. It's accepted if occurs in full term, but preterm babies has his explanation or pathogenesis process. We have uh, common pathogens. Uh, actually, not all cases we can isolate pathogens. But the anterior, most commonly is the anterior cocci. As you know, E. coli, Salmonella, Enterobacter, and Gipsiella. Staphylococcus species also, Clostridium species. Sometimes we have viruses in like 10%, uh, Candida uh, in like 1%, and uh, no organism isolated in uh, 3% of cases. So I will try to make it uh, uh, very interactive uh, now to paint a storm ourselves. I have a problem. Yes, okay, like this. So, what is the relation between the empiric antibiotics and NIC? So, we are discussing now the, uh, uh, the risk factors. So, the empiric antibiotics, the empiric antibiotic exposure for five or more days in preterm neonates before 29 week gestation was associated with the increased risk of necrotizing tirocolitis. Sorry. 
Threefold the increment in the risk of necrotizing tuberculitis uh, in infant receiving cumulative antibiotic treatment for more than 10 days in the absence of sepsis. This is very important PR because we can prevent this. So the, the most common talk now about the back the RBC's transfusion. Can back the RBC's transfusion cause necrotizing tuberculitis? So many observational studies reported temporary relation between the RBCs and transfusions. They noticed the presence of uh, 25 to 40% of all cases with pelvic who care 2 to 48 hours after uh, having a uh, back the RBCs, uh, RBCs transfusion. Risk of neck may have been uh, higher in infant who severely anemic before transfusion. Uh, now we have what's called transfusion associated neck term. Uh, it is uh, maybe different entity like Dr. Aydin said at first. Uh, however, uh, can back the RBC's transfusion because neck other studies in the country found no relation between the uh, back the RBC's transfusion and the neck, even the report severe anemia defined as hemoglobin like uh, 8 gram per deciliter is a given, in a given week was associated with a higher risk of necrotizing tuberculitis. So every team of these uh, researchers has his uh, justification. So in transfusion, the mechanism could be immune mechanism. Uh, the blood has anti, uh, the blood transfused has anti antibodies, biologically active lipids, free hemoglobin, red cells, membrane fragment, and the inflammatory cytokines present in the stored blood. Also, we can uh, explain by reperfusion oxygen injury of the anemic gut. Uh, elder RBCs can accentuate the microvascular ischemia and tissue hypoxia. Uh, in contrast, the anemia uh, can affect the perfusion. Uh, tissue hypoxia and anaerobic metabolism impaired blood maturation, impaired normal maturation of vascular autoregulation of preterm babies. After, if you are worried about back the R transfusion, should we withhold feeding during the RPC's transfusion? I don't know who's practiced this uh, in his units, but many units now, after hearing that transfusion is associated with neck, uh, uh, after reported increased neck, after implementing the implement the withholding of feeding during or before and the after back the transfusion. This is a study from uh, George Washington with Dr. Hany Ali reported that the incidence of neck decreased after withholding the feeding during back the RPC's transfusion. However, the Cochrane, this is Cochrane in 2019, uh, about stopping enteral feeding for prevention of transfusion associated necrotizing tuberculitis. They concluded randomized controlled trial evidence is insufficient to show whether stopping the feeds has an effect on the incidence of subsequent necrotizing tuberculitis or death. And the recommended large adequate power randomized control study are needed to address the issue. So this is not large randomized control study, but it's a randomized control study, uh, but with a small number. This is done in Australia and published 2020. Uh, it is a feed your uh, randomized control trials. They concluded there were no difference in splanking oxygenation when enteral feeding were either withheld continued or restricted during transfusion. They have three groups. One group, they use whole feeding, yeah, sorry, was whole feeding during transfusion and the before and the after. The other continue the same feeding. And the third group, they restricted the fluid, uh, the feeding uh, intake to 120 ml on vacation per day, the total uh, feeding. They found no difference in the oxygenation or perfusion as splanchnic. Uh, However, this is small, small, very numbers. I think the total is 60. And uh, uh, there is two randomized control study is running them about this issue. As we know, the uh, 90 
eight uh, percent of the preterm babies has feeding. This is starting feeding early, so should we delay the start of enteral feeding to decrease the incidence of improvising tuberculitis? It is different if we started the first day, second day, or later. So among extreme preterm and you need those who develop neck were NPO for longer period of time than control infants who are neck free. Keeping the patient MBO longer than five and a half days were more likely associated with the stage three neck, perforated neck, longer duration of mechanical ventilation and the ICU admissions, a higher mortality and the incidence of bacterial sepsis. So we will try to start all support to try as early as we can. Delaying feeding, don't protect the baby from in the ICU uh, neck. Uh, the second question is early enteral feeding increase the risk of neck. If we started early feeding, this increase the risk of neck. Cochrane Review 2013 found there is uh, no difference in the incidence of neck when beginning trophic feeding early within the first four days of life and continued them for one week compared to fasting group. No difference. A more recent study, meta-analysis and randomized control study, both published in 2019, no difference in the incidence of necrotizing tuberculitis or feeding intolerance when starting early to tell interruption. Decreased incidence of late onset sepsis and the length of stay, this is extra advantage. So starting early feeding now is accepted. So we started feeding, should we increment, increase the amount or volume rapidly or very slowly? Is rapid feeding increment increases the risk of necrotizing tuberculosis? We have what's called control trial for two incremental uh, milk feeding rates in preterm infants. Actually, this is published 2019. We have uh, uh, milk feeding rates, we have two groups, the first the group feeding 30 ml per kg with a day increment. The second the increment the group was 18 ml per kg and this was a standard. The primary outcome actually in this study was a survival without moderate or severe neurodevelopmental disability. No significant difference. However, it is low actually in the uh, rabbit group. As regards the necrotizing tuberculitis, no significant between group difference in confirmed or suspected late onset sepsis or pelvis stage two or three necrotizing tuberculitis. So feeding with increment 30 ml uh, uh, per kg per day is still not causing a higher rate of neck. So the next question, when the start feeding, this is a very important issue. When to start the enteral feeding in a small for gestational age with abnormal Doppler diastolic rate. Actually, most of the unit till now practicing to wait, wait for how long it's different for three days, five days, or you know. Randomized controlled trial conducted to compare early feeding in the first, uh, after the first two days versus delay after six days in small for gestational age, preterm, preterm, not only small for gestational age, but also preterm infants with abnormal antithetal ultrasound, either absent or reversible diastolic flu. The mean gestational age of the group was uh, 31 weeks. The number of the patient was 308, uh, 380 infants. They found that the early introduction of enteral feeding in the small for gestational age preterm infants results in earlier achievement of full enteral feeding and did not appear to increase the risk of necrotizing tuberculosis. However, when they analyzed the subgroups and comparing the babies less than 29 weeks and the elder paper, they found the baby was who less than 29. We gestation achieved the full feeding were later, 28 days versus 19 days for elder babies, or uh, elder babies as we regard the gestational age. Also, significant higher incidence of all stage of necrotizing tuberculitis, very significant, almost 39 
in versus 10. So hence the author concluded that the slower advancement of feeding may be required for this population. We have to remember in this study, we are using breast milk. It's breast, either the mother breast milk or the donor breast milk. So what is the time of onset? This is some discussion with the risk factors. Usually the onset is related to the gestation. The onset of necrotizing enterocolitis is inversely related to the gestational age. The earlier the gestational age, the later the chronological age at which the necrotizing enterocolitis occurred. Uh, the average age at onset is 20 uh, days if the baby born before 30 weeks, almost to two weeks if the baby born between 31 and the three weeks gestation, and six days if the baby born after uh, six, uh, 36 week of gestation. Clinical pictures uh, of the necrotizing tirocolitis, we have, uh, if we need to, to diagnose, we have thinking about clinical pictures and radiological and the laboratory. The clinical pictures, we have systemic manifestation and GIT manifestation. Please, during your round in the NICU, search for POS, because sometimes we have only GIT manifestation without systemic manifestation, uh, and the reverse of cares. No need to stop feeding for baby with sepsis, and they have no GIT manifestation. No need to start investigation for neck, and the baby is clinically well, no systemic manifestation, and only have some residual or uh, abdominal distension. So the systemic manifestation is lethargy, apnea, respiratory distress, bradycardia, temperature instability, uh, metabolic acidosis, poor perfusion, hypotension, uh, shock. So this is sepsis-like picture. However, as a GIT manifestation, we have abdominal distension, feeding intolerance with increased gastric residual, vomiting, we can have gross plot bleeding the rectum or occult bleeding, occasionally there is diarrhea, abdominal wall erythema and severe cases, abdominal tenderness and the decrease or absent bowel sounds. When you suspect that the baby is necrotizing tirocolitis, we have to do laboratory studies. We are doing CBC, searching for leukopenia, leukocytosis, neutropenia, neutrophilia, elevated immature total neutrophil count was shifted to the left, thrombocytosis, uh, thrombocytopenia, sorry higher or rising C-reactive protein. full septic workup should be done as most of the cases of necrotizing tirocolitis with translocation of bacteria could have sepsis also. We'll do blood culture. If the baby is stable, do CSF, culture and analysis, urine culture also. Blood gases, searching for metabolic acidosis and combined respiratory acidosis. Uh, renal function test to check the perfusion of the kidney, uh, electrolytes to check the hyponatremia, especially, and the uh, potassium level, coagulation profile, and the baby is more vulnerable for DIC. If we have proteinial fluid, we should show the uh, fluid for analysis, culture, uh, and sensitivity also. The abdominal X-ray, there remains a modality of a choice for diagnosis of necrotizing tirocolitis, but clinical correlation is very important because we have other diseases have the same finding of the X-ray on necrotizing tirocolitis and a different diagnosis. So clinical correlation is important. Standardization of X-ray interpretation aim to reduce the number of babies subjected to periods of uh, suspended oral feeding, as we said, uh, early and the timely institution of medical therapy in cases of necrotizing enterocolitis. So I recommend this uh, topic to read. This is published in uh, the Archive of Disease, uh, Child Education Practical Edition. It is published in 2019 and it is it's free access, a very nice topic about the X-rays and the sign, I will mention some of them uh, here. So what is the uh, position you request when you are called the technician? What's the position for the X-ray you will request for the baby? This is very important 
in our body. Usually, we show, we show uh, 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 anthrop steel. Then we should uh, ask for left lateral decubitus. This left lateral decubitus, the baby is sleeping on his uh, left, uh, left side, and the right side is up. Because if we have uh, new proteinium, we can see the uh, ear leak here. As you see, the cassette in behind the baby, and the beam come from front, and the baby on the left side. If the baby is not able to move and connected like to a high frequency or something, we can do a, a lateral cross table. The same technique, but the baby is sleeping is his uh, uh, back, so supine position, and the cassette uh, beside uh, the baby. This is very important. Left lateral decubitus. Searching for what in the radiological finding, we may have dilated uh, lobes. We have second wall, uh, uh, decreased gas of the abdomen, of this abdomen, fixed dilated lobes, doses intestinalis, portal vein, gas, and the new protein. This X-ray show uh, dilatation, abnormal dilatation of the gases, and we have some thickening the wall. Thickening of the wall, actually, it's here. Some people say it. this is matter of fluid in the proteinium and separating the os intestine from its side and give the look of thickened wall. But the best, the best modality to check the wall thickening is our sample we discussed. The second is a pneumatosis intestinalis. Pneumatosis intestinalis, as we discussed in the pathogenesis, was translocation of gas producing the bacteria. We have intraluminal gas. These intraluminal gases we'll see in the X ray like this. You see this arrow here also, here also, here. Can be very extensive, occur as in the left. Uh, slide or the right slide in the intestine, uh, stomach wall, the whole intestine, as you see. This is pneumatosis intestinalis. Yes, on the other side. So it can like, like ring or curve or line according to the end on or the X ray beam. So this is the pathogenesis of pathology of pneumatosis intestinalis from the lumen with uh, translocation of gas producing the bacteria. We have here uh, submucosa and even sometimes sub uh, uh, serosa. This is the baso, uh, pathology. Portal uh, vein gases in severe cases, we have like portal vein gases. Take care, this is a transient. Sometimes you see and disappear. And this is raised the modality of ultrasound, portal vein thrombosis. This is only a sign. And this means we are dealing with severe case of neck. We have fixed loop with another thick uh, omnia sign, and this means there is necrosis or gangrene of the intestine. This post studies for the same baby was 48 hours apart. This is from the uh, Atlas of Pediatric Surgery published book in published in 2020, we have the same fixed loop. Even if we have no, no, no new proteinium here, uh, this is a very uh, uh, surgical cause because we suspect that, suspect that we have necrosis in the intestine. So the new proteinium, this X-ray for the same baby, we have anthropostral diameter, as you see his translucency in front of the liver. It is not like the trans in but when the, uh, we take a position of left lateral decubitus, see how much the air and displacing the liver down for the same baby. So sometimes in anthroposterior X ray, the minimal pneumoperitoneum baby missed. This is another premium proteinium, also the same patient here, you see, splitting the liver around the liver on the left side. This is anthroposterior for the same baby. 
it's a sorry, different game. We have what's called football uh, sign. If you see, this is the air around pushing the whole proteinium. Uh, inside, this is severe pneumoproteinium with football sign, the American football also here in the right side. So now we have writhing chances for a bedside ultrasound and the Doppler ultrasound. It's more dynamic, more sensitive for detecting proteinium fluid collection, especially the minimal, moderate. Permit real-time visualization of the bio wall, wall sickness, it's better than X-ray. Uh, Pristalysis and the help us in the presence of necrosis and perfusion by the Doppler ultrasound. It's more sensitive than abdominal radiography in detecting bowel necrosis through the pristalysis and the perfusion. As we know, it's operator dependent. So we reach to the modified belly staging. Modified belly staging like 40 years ago, this is the nine um, bill announced for this staging at 1978. And after nine years was modified uh, by Walsh. They classified at grade one, grade B, stage two, and stage three. So stage one is suspected. We have systemic manifestation with very minimal gastrointestinal manifestation. The X-ray is normal or just the dilated loops. If we have gross bloody stool, this is stage A, B. Stage two, uh, this is a definite or diagnosed for medical uh, necrotizing material colitis. The baby is mildly ill. We have temperature stability, apnea, lethargy, seems like picture, but with increasing the abdominal signs, we have decrease or absent bowel sound with or without abdominal tenderness. X-ray here, we have pneumatosis intestinalis plus the dilated loops, fixed loops. So definite moderate uh, L, lower P. So the P, we have uh, in systemic manifestation, mild metabolic acidosis and the mild strong cytopenia. In the GIT manifestation, we have tenderness plus absent bowel sound with and without abdominal cellulitis and the erythema. We can feel at this stage mass in the right quadrant area. X-ray changes, we have uh, uh, plus abdominal tenderness, bowel sound without, uh, sorry. So stage three, this is surgical or advanced neck. We have A and B also. If we have pneumoproteinium, we are going with B. Actually modified uh, the question now in the uh, researchers, the modified belly staging can survive. Joseph New is the father of Nick now. Said outdated, it is more informative to uh, simply use the term of medical Nick to apply the condition with uh, well-defined clinical symptoms plus radiological uh, signs like pneumatosis intestinalis or portal gas vein venous gas, and the second is surgical neck to apply to uh, definitive intestinal necrosis seen at surgery or autopsy. Actually, most of the research are now speaking in their studies about stage two and stage three. They didn't mention stage one of bell staging. And some papers now managing, uh, mention the management like this. So what is the differential diagnosis or the disease mimic the necrotizing material colitis? We have a very famous spontaneous intestinal perforation, ischemic intestinal necrosis, uh, food protein or cow uh, 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 allergy induced enterocolitis colitis syndrome, congenital anomalies of the bowel that mimic neck. The most famous is a spontaneous intestinal perforation. Characterized by single non-inflammatory perforation, in contrast to the necrotizing material colitis, he has multiple perforation surrounded by high inflammatory reaction, typically located in the terminal area or colon. Primary occurs in infant less than one kilogram. 
the pathophysiology is not totally understood, giving some medication like steroids or non-steroidal uh, non anti-inflammatory medication may increase the risk. How to differentiate from the neck? Less severe systemic signs. Again, remember the criteria of diagnosis. Earlier age of onset, absent of neurotose intestinalis and portal, vein gas, uh, portal venous gas, the perforation has minimal surrounding necrosis or neutrophil infiltrates. Although both of them need surgical intervention, but it's very important because it affects the prognosis even in spinal cord. The second is ischemic intestinal necrosis, and this is usually occur in term babies, and occur or and the preterm also occurs with the baby's congenital uh, heart disease like hypoplastic left heart syndrome, truncus arteriosus, severe aortic palpitation, and aortopulmonary window. All these diseases affect the uh, perfusion of the gut. Uh, we have a splanchnic uh, ischemia. The colon is the most commonly involved site, proposed to be secondary to splanchnic ischemia, as we said. The food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome, or like cow milk allergy. Uh, it occurs in the artificially fed infants, occur if in term and preterm infants present with abdominal distension, bloody stool, flank discoloration, non hematosis intestinalis, improve after being treated with hydrolyzed formula, may have xenophilia and thrombocytosis. Actually, this is uh, occur usually in infants, larger infants, but there is many, many cases uh, now, uh, case series reported in the in ICU, in neonatal action. Sorry, going to the reverse. The other presence of congenital anomalies in the bowel that mimic necrotizing colitis. We have the Hirschsprung disease. Hirschsprung disease has a very characteristic uh, X-ray, usually, and presentation, usually earlier presentation. Uh, but the problem, sometimes we have what's called inflammatory enterocolitis because the stagnation in the colon, we have inflammatory enterocolitis, and this is similar to necrotizing colitis in the picture. And they have high morbidity. We have abdominal distension, vomiting, rectal bleeding, uh, also other intestinal obstruction due to volvulus or intussusception or meconium alias even may have the signs like neck, but usually earlier. And sometimes we have pneumatosis intestinalis in these conditions. It's very important to take care for the condition mimic necrotizing colitis. They sometimes say this is different entity uh, of uh, a neck. So how to manage the baby with necrotizing enterocolitis after diagnosis? We have principle for medical management. Just keep MBO with bowel decompensation or decompression. Start total parental nutrition and the fluid, respiratory and the cardiovascular support, antibiotic therapy, blood product and the fluid resuscitation, serial laboratory and the radiological monitoring. And this is very important for the X-ray. We may repeat the X-ray every six hours sometimes every 12 hours, according to the stage of the necrotizing hierocolitis. Also, we need serial lab to follow up the platelet, to follow up the coagulation profile, to follow up the electrolytes. This strategy uh, for the management plan, uh, stage one antibiotic plus MBO for three days and follow up with the X-ray and the clinically stage two MBO for seven to 14 days according to the stage and start TBN uh, also. Uh, stage three, usually we need fluid resuscitation, anaerobic support, ventilatory support and the blood product like platelet transfusion and uh, a fresh frozen plasma. Stage three, we need surgical B, we need surgical uh, management. So I will talk about the antibiotics. We will start or change the antibiotic to empiric broad spectrum antibiotics. Please follow up. Take care based on the common organism in your blood. Not suitable in United States, not suitable in Egypt, not suitable in Tunisia, 
even in different units in the same country we have failed. I know that the clip cell is in my unit, so I will start something again. The suggestion of ampicillin gentamicin or amicacin, clindamicin or uh, ampicillin or ciftex, ciftazidine uh, instead of ciflutex. Sometimes we start talking neuronium vancomycin if we are suspecting mesicillin resistant staph. Uh, metronidazole or clindamicin is added to cover the anaerobic uh, bacteria. Surgical management, please involve the pediatric surgeon from the start. Even from stage one, yes, once you suspect it. Necrotizing enterocolitis involves a pediatric surgeon in management. We have absolute indication for surgery uh, in the intestinal sound. This is will be discussed by Dr. Amin. Uh, but keep in mind, the perforation can occur without evidence of free air in the radiograph, especially in the extreme preterm. So if you are searching for pneumoprotein, sometimes we have perforation without pneumoprotein. 50 to 75% of perforation only have new protein improved in the extreme. Sometimes the gasless abdomen is going with, we have relative uh, uh, indication for uh, surgical management. Like resina in the abdominal wall, gas in the portal veins, fixed bowel lobes. This is very important because we suspect ischemia, positive paracentesis more than one centimeter, especially if there is fecal matter, clinical deterioration, and this is a debate usually between us and between the media surgeon, Dr. Amin will discuss this issue, worsening and deteriorating clinical condition, not improving or sign of peritonitis, uh, intractable acidosis, intractable thrombocytopenia, uh, increase the lactic acid. This is very important. One of them follow up usually in the lab. We follow lactic acid if you uh, it is available, especially in the blood gas machine. If you have blood gas machine with lactic acid. So can we prevent the necrotizing colitis? Yes. This is understanding of the pathogenesis will help us in the prevention. Prevention can start from antenatal. If we can postpone the preterm delivery, this is all under good. If not, we should receive antenatal stride because it decreases the neck, IVH, RDS. Uh, natal, during resuscitation, delayed cord clamping, potentially uh, it will prevent the anemia and also decrease the need of back the RBC transfusion. And this is direct will uh, protect or increase, decrease the risk of neck and back Good thermoregulation during transport and avoid hypothermia. Postnatal colostrum and the breast fit is a magic, magic shield against the necrotizing tirocolitis. Standardized feeding guidelines, this is very important. Many, many studies show that the standardized feeding protocols decrease the risk of necrotizing tirocolitis and the incidence of necrotizing tirocolitis. Avoid or shorten duration of empiric antibiotic therapy. Don't wait, don't leave the baby without uh, with uh, antibiotic because he's on CPAP, because the baby don't reach full intra feeding, because the baby still have UVC. Uh, once you have the negative culture of CBC, CRP, not suggesting infection, stop the antibiotics, please. Avoid anti acids and H2 blockers, standardized uh, uh, RBCs transfusion. So breast milk and neck, we have uh, nutritional and non-nutritional anti-infective properties helping in protection of uh, the babies from necrotizing tirocolitis. The incidence of necrotizing tirocolitis described to be six to 10 times higher in formula fed baby when compared to the breast fed baby. This is since 30 years ago and there's a research supporting uh, the uh, presence of materials or substance in milk, especially immunoglobulin A and uh, human milk oligosaccharides, probiotics, something like this. This is proposed mechanism for prevention of neck by the uh, human milk 
Also, uh, with the anti-infected property, the human milk improve the barrier function, improve the growth of the mucosa, and increase the proteolytic enzyme, improve the peristalsis, and increase the number of immunoglobulin uh, A, like to also. So, the commercial is usually the best, the best. Remember all the time. The second uh, rising star in the prevention is the probiotics. It is life microorganisms produce bacteriostatic and the bacteriostatic uh, substance prevent colonization of pathogens by competing for adhesion to the intestinal mucosa or plug the gut microbiota favoring the non pathogenic uh, bacteria. Prophylactic probiotic reduce the incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis, especially that of severe cases. Uh, in infant less than 1.5 kilogram. This is proved in multiple studies. However, the probiotics trial still controversial. Trials are difficult to generalize as mean as mean use. Uh, uh, different. We have different study design, different probiotic types, different infant diets. So mm, breast milk, donor milk, mixed or artificial different feeding times. Uh, also, we have different types of probiotics. We have different types and some study use only one antiprobiotics and other studies use one or more uh, probiotics. So we are still waiting for further studies. There are conflicting opinion also about giving live bacteria to vulnerable preterm babies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Mustafa, for this very interesting and exhaustive lecture. Uh, I may ask uh, Professor Adria to give us just a um, take home message. Right. Um, thank you very much, uh, dear Professor Mustafa, for such a wonderful presentation, very comprehensive, very practical, uh, answering the myth, a lot of myth about you, uh, about uh, necrotizing enterocolitis and feeding of the preterm. Actually, uh, the major problem is that, I'll tell you uh, something, the full-term baby is during uh, intrauterine life is swallowing 150 milliliters per day. So if the weight is three kilograms, he is swallowing almost half a liter of amniotic fluid every day. And after delivery, we stop everything. We leave him to starve. And this is very dangerous. Never leave the gut empty. That's why the golden hour is very important to start breast milk as soon as you can. As long as the baby is stabilized, start breast milk. This is the golden standard. This is the magic, the magic uh, protection against a lot of problems in the neonatal intensive care. So when we start early, the uh, breastfeeding, uh, when we avoid the antibiotics, the antibiotics are a disaster, really a disaster. The uh, cesarean section, we give antibiotic. Normal delivery, we give antibiotic. Uh, the baby in the intensive care receives antibiotic. We are creating the dysbiosis by ourselves. That's iatrogenic. This is very serious. The prolonged courses of antibiotics, we should avoid. This is really, uh, uh, there's a lot of studies about the duration of the antibiotic use and the mortality. I'm not talking about complications, I'm talking about the, the mortality. The mortality is higher with the longer courses of antibiotics. So please start as early as you can 
the breast milk, the first thing to go into the gut of the preterm baby is the breast milk. Start to uh, try to avoid antibiotics for the women the, uh, after delivery as much as you can. Try to avoid antibiotics in the neonatal intensive care as long as you don't need it. In our unit, we used to have to give ampicillin gentamicin for two days and we stopped the antibiotic as long as the culture is negative, CBC and CRP are, and are okay. But now we are trying even to avoid the double antibiotic, we use one antibiotic. Even sometimes we don't use antibiotic. We wait and observe the baby closely and see how it goes. Trying to avoid antibiotic will help a lot in saving a lot of children. Don't think that antibiotics will save the baby. It's a hazard, really it's a hazard. Definitely it will save the baby if there is infection, but if there is no infection, there's a lot of harm we're doing. This biosis, this is very important. This is a very important issue. So please, gut dysbiosis is very important. Early uh, is very important to avoid. Early introduction of breast milk, this is extremely important. Uh, the myth of the, uh, the umbilical catheter, the myth of uh, uh, giving the, uh, the blood transfusion, the myth of endomethacin, we do not stop enteral feeding. Enteral feeding is becoming more important than parenteral. You start early enteral feeding to achieve full enteral intake in one week in the infants, uh, 100 and, 100 and, 150 grams, uh, 1, 000, sorry, 1,050, 1,050, 500 grams. And in infants, 1,000 1, grams in two weeks maximum. So enteral feeding should start early to remove the parenteral nutrition with all the complication that we can see from, from the parenteral nutrition. It's very important. Early enteral, early enteral feeding, avoiding the antibiotics, use of, gold, of the, uh, the golden standard is the breast milk. And uh, I think this is the, the, the most important thing to remember avoidance of the antibiotic, giving the breast milk. This will save a lot of our children. By the way, hand washing, hand seriously, hand washing is important, is extremely important. Uh, I used to do that years ago before the era of uh, hand washing and the, 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 the infection control and so on. I used to do that, I would say, from the early 90s or late 80s maybe. Hand washing is extremely important before and after examining the baby. You will reduce the incidence of infection in your unit. It's extremely important. Uh, that's all, that's enough. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Sorry Thank for being you. so <laughs> Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you very much for uh, all those uh, comments. And uh, now that we have listened to the medical management of neck, let's move to the surgical side of this condition that requires the efforts of both neonatologists and pediatric surgeons. For that, Professor Amin Aksia will present the second lecture called uh, Surgical Management of Necrotizing Enticolites. Uh, Dr. Amin Aksia, you are welcome. He is a Tunisian pediatric surgery associate professor working in Fatima Bourdiba Teaching Hospital in Monastir um, and teaching in medical school uh, of Monastir. He worked also in Hospital Armand Trousseau and in Hospital Bicetre uh, in Paris uh, and in El Hadda Military Hospital in Saudi Arabia as consultant pediatric uh, surgery. Dr. Amir Xia is currently a board member of many scientific associations, International Pediatric Endosurgery Group, Middle East Chapter, a Pediatric Adolescent and Adult Forgot Interdisciplinary Symposium, the Tunisian Association of Pediatric Surgery, the Tunisian College of Pediatric Surgery, and Tunisian Association of Neonatal Care, which organizes this uh, webinar. 
He is also Monastir Medical School Vice Dean. So, Dr. Emil Qsia. Many thanks, Professor Sonia Nouri, for this kind introduction. This is really my pleasure and honor to be part of this nice webinar, and I would like to thank very much all the honorable audience. I would like also to thank our two prestigious guests, Professor Adel Riyad and Professor Mustafa Abdel Azim. We really enjoyed your lecture, Professor Mustafa. And uh, special thanks for all my friends in the Tunisian Neonatal Medical Care Association Board that gave me this opportunity to speak about the surgical management of necrotizing enterocolites. I don't know if you see my screen. That's very clear. Yes, okay. So uh, I was really excited of the subject because necrotizing anticolites is one of the commonest neonatal surgical emergencies that do need timely assessment and action in order to reduce the morbidity and mortality. It's true that the advances in the neonatal intensive care and the availability of total parental nutrition resulted in fewer infants requiring surgery. But surgery is still indicated in approximately one third of all diagnosed cases. And you must know that the overall mortality from neck is estimated at 15 to 30%, but rises as much as 50% in the patients who require surgical intervention. This surgical intervention can be done in the early period in order to reduce the degree of contamination and sepsis with preserving an adequate length of bowel to prevent short gut syndrome. Surgery Here, I will discuss the key point in the success of neck management. It's the relationship between the neonatologist and the pediatric surgeon. And this relationship should not be conflictual. You know, sometimes the pediatric surgeon can think that the neonatologist is pushing him to perform the surgery, even if it's not indicated. And on the other hand, the neonatologist can think that the pediatric surgeon is escaping from his responsibility. So instead, we must have a trust relationship. And to have a trust relationship between these two main protagonists, we should fix clear rules in the management of neck. And these rules will depend on two things. First of all, the scientific data but Here's also we should Amin. adapt this scientific data to professor our Amin, local... We see, we, sorry, Professor Amin, we can't see these slides. Can so you share your... We can see it. Please? We only saw the first slide. Otherwise, we can see it. Is it clear now? No, it's not yet. So I will share again? Yes. Yes, please. Do you see it now? Uh, not yet, but it's coming. Uh, I can see it. I don't know if anybody else can see it or not. Yes. Now we can see it now. Okay. Okay, so I will return to this key point in the management of uh, neck. It's the relationship between the neonatologist and the pediatric surgeon, and this relationship should not be conflictual. As you know, sometimes the pediatric surgeon can think that the neonatologist is pushing him to perform the surgery, even if it's not indicated. 
And the, in the other side, the neonatologist can think that the pediatric surgeon is escaping from his responsibility. So instead, we must have a trust relationship between those two protagonists. And to build this trust relationship, we must fix clear rules in the management of NEC. Those rules will depend on two things. First of all, the scientific data, and this scientific data should be adapted to our local conditions. You know, uh, personally, I worked in three departments in three different countries, and I can tell you that the management of NEC is different. It's not only a question of money. Money is very important, the material that is available and so on, but also there are other factors like the availability of pediatric surgeon in your center or also some ethical and cultural issues. Now regarding the scientific data, the major concern that is always debated between the pediatric surgeon and the neonatologist is the selection of patients for surgery. And now it is well established that in the early period, there are clear indication that are the intestinal perforation that you can see sometimes in the X-ray with pneumoperitoneum or the lack of improvement despite optimal medical treatment. And here the classification of uh, Bell is very useful to know this patient. It's the 3B uh, stage in this classification. Also, the time to operate is very important to prevent severe complications. And here, we should know the risk factors. And there are well-known risk factors that was uh, done uh, by my friend, Professor Mostafa, like the persistent and worsening pneumatosis on serial radiographic examination, the presence of uh, the portal venous uh, gas, the sudden hyponatremia, the sudden acidosis, or a profound sustained drop in the platelet count suggestive of gangrene. But uh, we found a lot of papers that are talking about some new uh, predictive factors, like uh, I found this in, in this article that was published in 2020 in the European Journal of Pediatrics. So they are speaking about the low gestational age, uh, non-maternal corticosteroid administration, the early onset of neck, uh, hemodynamically significant patent ductus arterius for which hibuprofen was administrated. We can find also uh, updates in uh, the use of ultrasound to predict bowel gangrene in abscess of pneumoperitoneum. And this criteria include the fluid quantity, the bowel th uh, thick uh, of the wall, and also the bowel uh, wall ecogenicity and the bowel perfusion, like you see in this examples. Regarding later surgery, here the indications also are clear. As you know, in neck we have ischemia and ischemia can lead to stricture and also to fistula. The diagnosis would depend on clinical feature, but it will be confirmed in the enema contrast study, as you see in this example. Here we have a stricture in the contrast study uh, enema, and here we have an iliosigmoid fistula. This is a picture that I take from this nice book written by our friend Sheriff uh, Emil. And the treatment for this two uh, complication is the resection anastomosis. Usually it's done after six weeks. Uh, of uh, the onset of uh, neck. Also, later surgery can be done to restore intercontinuity. And also here, the enema contrast study is very useful to check if there is any structure below the stoma. And also later surgery can be done in centers for intestinal transplantation. You must know that uh, neck is one of uh, the indications of intestinal transplantation for short gut syndrome, but the results are not uh, promising. Now, what about the surgical options? Regarding the surgical option in the early period, we will have three ones. First of all, the laparotomy. Second, the peritoneal drainage. And third, the peritoneal needle section. Let's begin by our first option. Laparotomy 
will have the advantage to let us to explore the viability of the bowel. Also to perform the uh, lavage in order to decrease the effect of toxin. And you must know that the standard treatment with laparotomy is resection of necrotic bowel and stoma formation. However, your strategy will depend on the baby statement. Is he stable or unstable? And it will depend also on the lesions that you will find. find. So let's take some examples of the lesions that you can find in the laparotomy. You can find like in this, this example, a good viability of the bowel and here you will perform a lavage with drainage. Second constatation, you can found focal lesions and here you will perform a resection of the necrotic bowel. And after you have two options, you can perform a stoma or an anastomosis. And each option has its advantages and disadvantages. Surely stoma is the safest option, but you can have complications like fluid and electrolyte imbalances prolapse, retraction, skin excoriation, or wound breakdown. And here you will need for future reversal surgery. For the primary anastomosis, here you will need, you will not need, excuse me, a future reversal surgery, but you can widespread systemic inflammatory response and you are exposed to complications like leak stricture, especially if you have a frail bowel. Third constatation that you will find and you can find after laparotomy is multifocal neck. And in this case, the patient is too unstable to undergo a resection. And there is a significant risk of major bleeding. So here you will proceed to a salvage uh, technique to stabilize the neonate. You can perform a proximal diverting jejunostomy, but here the fluid and electrolyte loss can be uh, troublesome. Or you can uh, proceed with a wait and see approach. So you will make a lavage and you make a second look after two or three days to assess again GATS viability and to perform limited resection to avoid short GAT syndrome. Or you can perform the clip and drop technique. So here the gangrenous bowel segments are resected with the ends tied off. The bowel with questionable viability is retained, and you will relook to the lap, uh, you will perform, excuse me, a relook laparotomy after two days to determine the true extent of the disease. So further segments affected can then be resected again, and the stoma plus minus anastomosis can be performed. Here, the advantages of this technique is to control the initial sepsis and to avoid an unnecessary extensive bowel resection. The fourth constatation is panintestinal lesions. So here you will perform lavage and drainage with jejunostomy or clip and drop or wait and see approach. In some cases, you can have difficulties to close the layers and you can perform a laparostomy with vac uh, dressing. Here we arrive to the most serious constatation it's really a nightmare for a pediatric surgeon when you find a total intestinal gangrene and you hear you don't have any other option than the withdrawal of treatment. Here we summarize uh, all the options that we can have, uh, find after a laparotomy. Now we will move to our second option, it's peritoneal drainage. Peritoneal drainage was described for the first time in Toronto for unstable babies. And we remarked that this baby survived without any surgery, or at least they improved and led us to proceed after to laparotomy in better conditions. The, the peritoneal drainage had the advantages to remove the toxic effluence, to decompress the abdomen, to improve the respiratory condition and promote spontaneous healing. And also the big advantages, the procedure is quick. You can do it even in the bedside with less complications risk. In the literature, the success is between 20% to 80% with drainage alone. And this uh, difference will depend on the patient selection. 
but you can find this unmissable article that appeared in the New England of journal, journal of Medicine, and it's a very well uh, done article. And here, uh, there is no doubt, peritoneal drainage and laparotomy give the same results for uh, this patient with severe neck. So here I will return to the local condition. We in Monastir, we are now plus uh, attempting to do to perform uh, drainage because we are we have in charge a lot of uh, centers that are far from monastery like Sous or uh, Terwen or uh, or uh, Mahdia. So we prefer uh, to make the surgeon move to the patient instead to make the patient move to the surgeon and with the transplantation risk that you know. The third option is the peritoneal needle section. Peritoneal needle section was described for spontaneous intestinal perforation. And here it's debated. Dr. Mustafa spoke about this. Uh, some uh, will uh, consider spontaneous intestinal perforation as part of neck. Other will consider it as a specific disease, a particular disease, especially it's affecting a special population. Here we will perform a punction of the right hypochondrium with exifflation of air and fluid. Two final points that I will develop. First of all, the place of laparoscopy. As you know, in laparoscopy, we will require the use of carbon dioxide insufflation to create a nomoperitoneum, which may negatively impact on the patho, uh, pathophysiology. So we should need a careful patient selection the other point is the management after primary surgery. So we'll begin by parental nutrition till optimal healing. It can, uh, you can obtain this optimal healing after seven to two days, but this should need daily evaluation and alteral nutrition uh, will be uh, introduced after consultation of neonatologist and surgeon. Here we will come to our take home message. First of all, the absolute indication for surgery is intestinal perforation. There is a role for bowel resection and primary anastomosis in limited uh, neck. An enterostomy is the usually preferred approach, but should be weighted up against the stoma risk. Severe neck can be managed with a high proximal regenostomy or using the clip and drop technique. And there is limited evidence of the role of laparoscopy in neck. Peritoneal drainage is a good option even considered by some as only a salvage procedure, whereas others have used it successfully as definitive management. And my final conclusion would be the key point in the success of uh, the management of neck is first of all, the trust relationship between the neonatologist and the pediatric surgeon, because at the end we are only one team and we have the same goal. And the best treatment is the prevention, prevention of neck and prevention of severe form of neck. And here it was really well developed by Dr. Mostafa. We are speaking about uh, breastfeeding, about probiotics and so on. Thank you so much for uh, your attention, and I hope that you will visit us soon in Tunisia, just after this uh, pandemic. You are really welcome in Tunisia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Amin Qsia for this uh, uh, interesting um, uh, lecture about uh, surgical management of uh, necrotizing anticolites. If there are any comments or any question, we, uh, uh, we, we will discuss them at the end of the session. And uh, now I uh, invite uh, Dr. Manel Billallah to present her uh, clinical case Necrotizing intercolites in a premature infant, a challenging uh, situation. Dr. Manel uh, Bilalah is uh, an associate professor in our department, in the uh, neonatology department at Farhat Hashed Hospital uh, in Sous. She is also teaching in faculty of medicine of uh, Sous. Uh, Manel. 
Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Professor Nouri. And uh, before I begin, I would um, I want I would like to uh, to thank the Tunisian Neonatal Medical Care Association for giving me the opportunity uh, to uh, to present. Uh, my uh, my clinical case and uh, this case will illustrate uh, what has been said in the previous uh, presentation you share your screen yes There will be some questions and uh, the participants can uh, answer those questions. Necrotizing enterocolites in a premature infant was a challenging uh, situation. And our patient was uh, Shife. Uh, she was a female newborn, uh, issued uh, for uh, of uh, triplet pregnancy, uh, born at uh, 30, just as in weeks by a 30-year-old uh, mother, uh, Prima Gravida. The pregnancy was uneventful uh, until 29 just weeks uh, when uh, the mother uh, went into a preterm labor. She received one course of pulmonary maturation therapy. A premature rupture of membranes uh, occurred uh, three days uh, before delivery. And uh, in spite uh, the tocolysis, uh, the, the labor, the preterm labor could not be stopped and cesarean section was performed. She fell with the first triplets with, uh, with a good extrauterine adaptation. Uh, she, she was admitted to neonatal IQ for neonatal respiratory distress and uh, prematurity. And uh, on physical examination, she was eutrophic with a weight of uh, 1,355 grams. She presented with uh, normal gly glycemia and temperature. She had uh, oxygen saturation about 97%. Uh, she had tachypnea and uh, mild chest retraction. Uh, she was uh, stable. Uh, uh, she had. Uh, she was uh, hemodynamically stable. Uh, the abdomen was uh, soft and depressible with uh, without uh, visceral megalias, and the rest of uh, the physical examination was unremarkable. And to sum up, uh, our patient was a female newborn, the first triplet. She was a preterm 30 gestational weeks with a good Abgar score. She had appropriate weight for gestation age, but uh, she, wa she, she was a very low birth weight infant, and she was admitted to our unit for moderate resp respiratory distress. Uh, this is the first uh, chest and abdominal uh, X-ray of our patient uh, showing uh, pulmonary good pulmonary expansion and bilateral uh, reticular pattern with, uh, with acceptable distribution uh, of gas uh, in the abdomen uh, under CIPA. And the initial uh, management consists uh, in um, consists to sip up support with the minimum of uh, minimal oxygen needs. Uh, she, she needs, uh, she don't, she didn't need surfactant administration. Uh, an umbilical catheter was placed and parotidal nutrition was started. Uh, she received antibiotics for early onset, suspected early onset neonatal infection, and uh, she received caffeine, blood culture, and blood gas analysis were performed. On the second day of life, uh, she passed to meconium spontaneously and the trophic feeding start, was started on the second day with breast milk and slowly progressed. A peak line was placed and on the third day of life, she presented with apnea. And the question, according to you, what are the pro probable causes of apnea in this newborn? A, hypoglycemia, B, hypocalcemia, C, intraventricular hemorrhage, D, patent ductus arteriosus, or infection? And you can answer.
Mm. And the answers. And all the proposals uh, were uh, right. Uh, in the case uh, of uh, apnea, uh, in the preterm infant, uh, testes uh, must be, we should uh, perform uh, testes. And in our case, uh, case uh, biologic testes were negative. Uh, CBC, electrolytes, calcium, uh, uh, glycemia, uh, renal function, and CRP was negative, uh, and we stop uh, antibiotics. Caffeine dosage was normal, and the chest uh, X-ray was performed uh, in order to look for uh, uh, pneumothorax uh, because the baby was uh, under CPAP, uh, was normal, and both uh, cardiac and cranial ultrasound were uh, without uh, uh, abnormalities. Uh, she presented with repetitive and severe apnea, uh, requiring intubation and uh, ventilator support with uh, minimal ventilation. And uh, this ventilation uh, lasted uh, two days. On day five of life, she was intubated uh, to CPAP. And uh, on the ninth day of life, she started on uh, OptiFlow. Uh, during the hospitalization, she presented with the jaundice requiring uh, phototherapy. She remained uh, respiratory and uh, hemodynamically stable. The abdomen was soft, depressible, peristaltic, without visceromegalias. And the, on the 11th day of life, uh, she was on continuous feeding with breast milk and preterm formula, reaching 100 milliliters per kilogram per day. On the 12th day of life, she presented with gastrointestinal signs with increased gastric residuals, bilious vomiting, and temperature instability. And as you can see in this photo, the abdominal distation with bilious vomit, vomiting. Uh, she had tachycardia with uh, good uh, mean blood pressure. She, uh, she had hypotonia, pylor, and uh, without uh, blood stools on the examination. According to you, what would be what, what would be your management in this case? Zero diet, fluid resuscitation, laboratory tests and radiography, antibiotic therapy, surgical intervention, or contrast enema. And you can answer. Okay. Uh, I have a problem. <laughs> Good. And the uh, good answers were A, R, W, I, B, C, D. And uh, in case of uh, suspecting uh, necrotizing enterocolitis uh, and um, parenteral, uh, we have, uh, we should, uh, uh, parenteral nutrition was started, gastric tube for decompression abdomen, fluid resuscitation, analgesic treatment, and uh, the patient received antibiotic uh, with uh, imipenem, amikacin, and uh, vancomycin. Uh, and uh, this prescription of antibiotic uh, depends on the uh, ecology of our unit. And uh, complementary investigation were performed. Which tests would you prescribe? Blood culture, arterial blood gas, CRP, CBC, abdominal CT scan, electrolytes tests, 
abdominal radiography or stool culture? And you can answer. And the right answers are A, C, D, and E. And uh, for uh, in suspecting uh, uh, necrotizes, uh, necrotizes in teropolites, we have we should uh, practice or we should perform uh, biological tests and uh, like uh, blood culture, arterial blood guys, CRP and CBC electrolysis tests and. Uh, uh, to confirm and for the diagnosis of neck, we have to perform abdominal radiography and uh, stool culture. This is the, the abdominal chest X-ray of our patient. And according to you, what does abdominal X-ray show? You can answer. Okay, and the good answers were R, C, D, and E. And uh, the abdominal X-ray of our patients show a dilated bowel loops with the bowel thickening and pneumatosis. Uh, there is no uh, portal venous gas and uh, no pneumonia. Laboratory tests uh, showed uh, metabolic acidosis uh, high level uh, lactate, uh, lactate uh, of lactate, uh, leukopenia and anemia in uh, the CBC, and uh, high level of uh, CRP uh, to uh, 245 milligram per liter. And in this situation of, uh, of uh, the, the, the context of the premature uh, with the neck, we have to, uh, to perform a cranial ultrasound uh, to look for uh, hemorrhage, intraventricular hemorrhage. And in our case, uh, the cranial ultrasound was normal. Blood, cerebral spinal fluid, and urine culture were negative. Our patient was tachy had tachycardia, and uh, intubation uh, was indicated because of the abdomen distension and uh, oxygen saturation of 80%. She was on parenteral nutrition. She had morphine treatment, but uh, no blood pressure support uh, until this, uh, this day. On 15 day of life, uh, corresponding to the third day of uh, neck, uh, she presented with increased abdominal circumference, erythema in the abdominal wall, bradycardia, hemodynamic instability, and increased oxygen need. In this situation, what should we suspect? Now it's come of neck. Uh, we should suspect complication of neck and the major complication is the intestinal perforation. And uh, suspecting intestinal perforation, we have to perform uh, radiographics. And uh, as uh, we see in the previous uh, uh, conference, we have, to, uh, we have to perform plain uh, X-ray, abdominal X-ray, and uh, lateral incidence. This is uh, the plain abdominal uh, X-ray of our patient showing gas under diaphragm and uh, on this uh, x-ray uh, it may be not evident uh, uh, 
the promoperitonium uh, may be not evident, and uh, so we have to complete with the, the lateral incidence if we suspect perforation, intestinal perforation, and uh, the lateral incidence of our patient uh, showed the gas uh, under the anterior abdominal wall and uh, corresponding to the peritoneum lesion. Uh, perforation intestinal, uh, intestinal perforation was the major, was uh, major on the first uh, indication for emergency surgery. And before uh, the transfer uh, of the newborn to surgery, we have to practice uh, laboratory tests. And uh, in our cases, uh, there are no contraindication of, uh, for the emergency surgery. The baby uh, had uh, mild anemia with uh, thrombocytopenia and uh, the coagulation profile was correct and CRP was still positive. The baby was transferred uh, to the pediatric uh, surgery uh, department and uh, a laparotomy, uh, expir expiratory laparotomy was, uh, was, uh, was indicated, uh, confirming the neck involving colon, uh, peritonitis, multiple perforation, moderate oocytes and pyogenic membranes. And the surgical procedure uh, consisted to uh, 20 centimeter intestinal resection uh, accompanied with end-to-end uh, -end anastomosis with uh, peritoneal drainage and a surgical central uh, venous line uh, was uh, inserted. In this slide, uh, you have the, the photo of uh, the laparotomy. And uh, as you can see, uh, the bowel necrosis, pyogenic membranes, peritonic signs, and multiple perforation. After a return from the operating room, the, the baby uh, had the paler, uh, ventilator support, and gastric decompression. Uh, laboratory test is uh, performed uh, showing uh, uh, anemia, severe anemia at uh, five gram per deciliter with uh, thrombocytopenia of uh, uh, 40,000, uh, 640,000 uh, platelets. Uh, the other uh, parameters were acceptable and the coagulation profile was correct. She uh, had received uh, red blood cell concentration and the platelet transfusion. This is uh, the abdominal and uh, chest abdominal X-ray uh, after surgery with uh, the peritoneal drainage. And uh, question in our case: What were the risk factors of neck apnea, antenatal corticosteroids, sepsis, umbilical lines, early onset of anterior feeding, or prematurity? And you can answer. And the good answers and the correct answers uh, were uh, are A, C, D, and F. Uh, our patient uh, presented with apnea, she had sepsis, umbilical lines, and uh, she was uh, returned with a very low birth weight. And according to you, in our case, the staging of neck using modified bell criteria was A, stage 1B, B, stage 2B, C, stage 3A, or G, stage 3B. And you can answer.
Okay. And the right answer was what well, is D. Shifa, we can classify Shifa as being in the stage 3B of uh, bile criteria. Uh, since she presented with systemic signs or so systemic manifestation, she had uh, bradycardia, uh, hypotension, uh, instability, temperature instability. She had gastrointestinal signs. She had metabolic acidosis and uh, thrombocytopenia and uh, intestinal perforation. So. Uh, uh, it presented, uh, she presented uh, with uh, severe uh, necrotizing uh, enterocolites. On the second day of life, she had pylor, an increased bilious gastric residuals, and a fresh heat bleeding uh, observed by means uh, of the peritoneal drainage. And uh, the photo showing the bleeding uh, throughout the peritoneal drainage. An assessment of the patient was requested to the pediatric surgery department and a surgery, surgical emergency was ruled out. Surgery emergency such as uh, the world instance of the anastomosis, the um, uh, injury uh, during the laparotomy or uh, liver hemorrhage and uh, the probable cause of this, this bleeding uh, may be uh, medical causes and uh, coagulation uh, profile uh, revealed uh, just uh, thrombocytopenia with a level of uh, uh, 40,000 40, platelets and anemia at uh, 10 gram per deciliter with a co coagulation profile, uh, correct coagulation profile. And uh, our patient uh, was transfused uh, uh, with red blood cell and platelet concentration with a good outcome. And in the context with uh, bleeding, anemia, uh, premature uh, infant, an abdominal ultrasound and cranial ultrasound were performed to look for uh, deep hematoma. And abdominal ultrasound uh, revealed a hepatic collection, uh, three centimeters in diameter. It may be related to abscess or hematoma. Our CRP was still positive, uh, 115 milligram per liter. Uh, blood stool culture were negative, but uh, urine culture was positive to candida albicans. And uh, in this context, uh, our patient uh, was uh, an infant at risk of uh, candida infection. Uh, he, she was put on uh, injection of uh, fluconazole. In our case, it started off candidiasis infection were preterm, uh, very low birth weight, broad spectrum uh, antibiotherapy, central venous line, bowel rest with parental nutrition, neck, intestinal perforation, and digestive surgery. On the eighth uh, postoperative day, she was extubated to OptiFlu. And uh, on ninth day of life, she, she was opening a room air with good uh, oxygen saturation. She passed the stool on the seven days, on the seven postoperative day, and uh, there are uh, no secretion through uh, the peritoneal drainage. Drainage was uh, took off, uh, uh, took off on the 13th uh, day, postoperative day. Uh, there are no orogastric tube out output and no uh, sign of local infection. And after surgery notice, uh, uh, the enteral feeding was uh, reintroduced on the 14, uh, 14th postoperative day with uh, formula uh, with protein hydrolyzide. And uh, for diagnosis of the hepatic lesion, uh, hematoma or abscess, an abdominal CT scan was performed and uh, showed hepatic subcapsular fluid lesion. Uh, for uh, of uh, 40, 40 millimeter in diameter. And after multidisciplinary consultation with pediatric surgery and radiologists, uh, they concluded to perihepatic hematoma in the process of liquefaction and uh, no suggestion of an invasive investigation. Our patient received 21 days of fluconazole for candida urinary tract infection. 
and the CRP was negative on the 20th day, uh, 22 days uh, post-operative day. The full enteral food feeding was established on the 48th day of life, and the bottle was uh, initiated on the 49th day of life uh, with correct gestational age of uh, uh, 37 weeks of gestation. Uh, the follow-up of the preterm infant, we performed the thyroid uh, tests, uh, uh, and uh, they were uh, they were no uh, they were normal. And examination uh, didn't show a sign of retinopathy of uh, premature. And the uh, follow-up uh, abdominal ultrasound uh, showed an increase in the, and decreased uh, signs. Uh, this uh, decrease in uh, had decreased uh, that the lesion decreased in size and then disappeared. And the question, what may be the long-term consequence of neck in this premature, according to you, cholestasis, development delay, short bowel syndrome, intestinal structure, or postnatal growth restriction? And you can answer. Okay, and uh, the right answer is A, B, D, and E. Our patient uh, uh, may be uh, not at risk of short bowel syndrome because the uh, uh, re rejection of uh, 20 centimeter of the bowel was performed. I have a problem to pass in. Our patient was discharged on the 69 days of life uh, with the correct the gestational age of uh, 39 weeks gestation and uh, weighing uh, 2,300 grams. This is uh, her growth curve. And uh, on the follow-up, uh, our patient follow-up, after a period of uh, six months, she had weight of uh, five, five kilograms and complementary feeding uh, was introduced uh, without a problem, well tolerated. Uh, an electro electroencephalography and uh, evoked studies were performed and uh, are normal. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Manel Bilalla, for uh, this interesting case that uh, illustrates the challenging management of um, great premature uh, baby in the NICU with uh, many complications uh, and with necrotizing anticolides um, with a, a good outcome. Uh, so, we have many, many questions and many comments, and um, it shows the, 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 the interest of uh, this uh, subject uh, for the neonatologists, for the pediatric surgeons. So we must, uh, we must uh, choose 
uh, some questions. So we will start with uh, Professor uh, Mustafa. You have many, many, many questions, <laughs> Professor Mustafa. I, I, uh, I try to. Uh, so, uh, from uh, Dr. Uh, Fatma Zohrashu, she's professor of neonatology uh, in uh, Tunisia. Uh, she asks uh, about uh, uh, amoxicillin and clavulanic acid given to mother before birth is related uh, to high risk of neck. What do you think about this? And what about this attitude in Egypt? Yes, this is a very good question. Uh, as we know, we talk about the microbiota and dysbiosis. 